I flew 30 missions in 79 days. Last well, year, saw those B-24s are going down. Patton's 9th Armored Division through Europe, through about 80 combat yep. missions. Fly almost everything except jets and very heavy. I was wounded. seriously wounded on my last and mission. Two missions we stayed on D-Day. All through the end of the war. I was a Thunderbolt pilot in World War II. I was a P-38 pilot with the first fighter group. I ended up in B-24s and spent a few years or a few months getting shot at. I was in the service uh, as a ball turret gunner on a B-17. Became a uh, fighter pilot uh, flying P-47s. I was an air transport command pilot. I volunteered for the Army Air Corps in those days. I was happy, the happiest days of my life. Cal Arrow was the first civilian training base for pilots, and it was the first of many that came up after the war started. What I remember about Cal Arrow, where the cadets slept, it wasn't barracks, it was motel type rooms with two cadets to a room. And I remember one captain in particular, he used to put us in a brace and he said, jump up! And we would jump up and say, who the hell told you to come down? <laughs> <laughs> and I first taught at Cal Aero Academy as a ground school instructor and then became a flight instructor. There were young people that were, some of them were younger than I was, and a lot of them became pilots on B-24s or B-17s. And they trained there and we were getting ready to go overseas. And at that time, that was 1942, now, during my pre-flight, everybody was talking about Ontario. It's like a country club. It's, it's real beautiful over there. So, lo and behold, I got my orders, and uh, I came here to uh, Cal Arrow. Another interesting story I can tell you about Cal Arrow is we were uh, flying these Stearmans. The PT-17 was an open cockpit, and one of my classmates, he was from Alaska, and he was practicing he decided to relax a little bit by taking, undoing his seatbelt. And a BT-13 made a fighter pass at him, dove on him like this, and poor Sam, without remembering that he'd undone his seatbelt, popped the stick forward to get away from that BT that was dive bombing on him. It popped him right out of the cockpit. He had grabbed the tail. Uh, when he came down, when he got popped out of there, he grabbed the tail and he was fighting to get back in, but of course he couldn't do it. And uh, he, there was only about 2,500 feet of elevation. He let go, pulled his ripcord, floated down to the ground. I had all these aspirations at 18 years old of being a fighter pilot. And I figured I'd go down and shoot down, pretty much shoot down the Luftwaffe all by myself. But instead, I ended up in B-24s and spent a few years or a few months getting shot at by people I wanted to shoot down. So these are the real here. These are fighter pilots. I uh, went through this school here in uh, 1943, and we went to the 366 fighter group, and we stayed together all through the end of the war and had some exciting stories to tell. The Battle of the Bulge was called Operation Bowden Plate. And the Germans saved up all their fighters. They sent a thousand airplanes out and talked about bad luck. 200 of them got shot down by their own uh, anti aircraft because the mission was a secret and they were on top of low clouds and the, they flew over some intense uh, anti aircraft. My squadron mates that were up, they shot down about eight or nine. Ours was the only field that didn't suffer any real damage from the, from that January 1 attack. Tell him about the guy who shot down two that day. I didn't shoot him down that day. I shot him down the first day of the Battle of the Bulge. We saw this big dogfight going on in the sky, and the flight leader said, jettison your bombs, we're getting into it. And that was the first dogfight that I was ever in. Well, a few miles west of Tokyo, twin planes start coming in from above us, which we didn't anticipate. But they came in and they didn't ram us, but they did shoot us up. And our whole nose section was blown out. And you know you've got to bail out, but you wanted to hang in there as long as you could. I estimate, as I saw the ground coming up, 
that I was about 3,000 feet above the ground when I pulled the rip cord. I shot down one airplane and, uh, and then I was circling under the overcast and I called the flight leader and I told him, I said, Cully, I got one. What do you want me to do now? And he says, help me if you can. He says, I'm shooting at a Fuck Wolf 190 and I think there's two of them on my tail shooting at me. All I had to do was pull my throttle back a little bit and coast down behind those two Fuck Wolves and blast them. They had been shooting our pilots in parachutes and I asked Cully, I said, I got him, do you want me to kill him? And he says, no, let him go. He'll probably come down behind our lines. On a strafing mission, uh, uh, January 1st, I get a call from the tower, we're being, uh, we're being attacked, we're being attacked. So I, I firewalled the airplane, but by the time I got back to Betz, which was our base, the, the Germans had dispersed already, and I see all these P-47s burning, and uh, as I always do, I buzz the field before landing, stupid me, I buzzed the field after these guys have been strafing, and everybody, was going, they were gonna shoot me down. Then on August, 28th, 1945, the war had been over two weeks. We were still there, but planes came over that day and they were B-29s, no shots being fired at them. And they dropped the food to us and tipped their wings to us. And they'd not forgotten us, they came back for us.